Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Synth in our fifth and final chapter review. I'm so happy that you've joined us. Um, you'll notice that uh, the other couple weeks I've done, my, my daughter has been here. Well, she, she couldn't be here today, uh, but I asked her a Christmas question. And I asked her what her favorite thing to eat was during the Christmas season, and she said cookies. Um, I think that is a warning for us to make some cookies at home, so we'll have to get on that pretty soon, or we shall face her wrath. Uh, it's a sweet wrath, though, so we're happy to, happy to do that. I like cookies, too. Um, today, the fifth chapter is called Jesus Changes Everything. How true that is, and I hope that as we progress through this study, that you found it to be uh, hopeful and helpful, and that maybe even though some of this material is very familiar to us, that you found a fresh perspective on how to look at Advent and how that might affect who we are as Christians and people of God. So, Jesus changes everything. It's not a small idea, but it is an absolute true, uh, true statement to make. In, some, in a truth that we can hold on to. So we're going to talk about a couple things today. We're going to talk about timing, and we're going to talk about scandal. And we're going to talk about how we can define scandal, what that means when it comes to Advent. So our, our verse for the day is Galatians 4.4. 4. Um, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of woman. So let's talk about timing. Um, Acevedo spent some time talking about why, when, why the time that Jesus was born was the perfect time. And it takes um, a history lesson uh, to understand that a little bit better. We're not going to do that today. I just want to mention a couple things. One, think about the time, that, think, of, think about Jerusalem during that time. The temple was in place, but it was there was Roman occupation going on. So there was this tension, this political tension that was happening. So it was a very difficult time. Uh, maybe, maybe there was a time where people in that area really needed, I don't know, a savior perhaps. Uh, but it was also time, if you look at um, if you look at the old scriptures, the prophets, all of this started to swirl around. But the truth of what was happening at that time began to became to match came to match what was happening here came to match the, the promises of the prophets, and which is why we um, which is why we read those scriptures from Isaiah um, in our Advent readings, uh, because what we've been promised is now coming true in the difficult reality of that era. Now, when we talk about the early church, one of the other great points of timing is that along with the Roman occupation came the Roman technology. If you look at the early church and how it grew, um, you can see that during in the diaspora, the Jewish community that, community that was spread out across the land, the Christian message which started in the Jewish community was able to spread because of the Roman transportation uh, transportation and the roads that had been built. So the Roman occupation created this political tension, but it also created opportunity for the, the message to be spread. I'm not sure that has a lot to do with Advent, but I do find it to be an interesting irony that that's how it grew. So timing. If you look at page 101, if you have your book with you, I think it's, it's, this is a, a really interesting perspective from Yaroslav Pelikan, who wrote these words about the impact of Jesus' life. That's the line there. And he said, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. Fairly remarkable. If it were possible, with some sort of super magnet, to pull up out of history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? It's a pretty astounding statement, and a pretty, uh, a pretty succinct. Or a, 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 it, it's just a, it's a it's a nice observation to make. So, and I think it's also very true. How much of our culture and society and history would be removed if we took his name out of things? How expansive this story really is, and the truth that's come from it. So the question is. If this is a story that can permeate all of history and change the direction of history, how can it change us personally on a deeply intimate relational level with God? Well, that's the scandal part of all this. Um, it was written in this book, but I actually heard it a few years ago from uh, our bishop, Bishop McAlilly, at a, at a meeting that we actually had here at our church. 
Um, and he was talking to a bunch of preachers, as he will do at times. And he said uh, this line that has stuck with me since. He said, you need to preach to your folks that there's nothing that they can ever do that's going to make God love them more. But there's also nothing they can ever do that's going to make God love them less. That's a scandal, isn't it? We feel like that we have to prove ourselves over and over to God so that we can gain more and more of his love. But there are also people in our lives who we feel like, you know, they don't just, they don't deserve it, right? I've told this to some of our classes before when it comes to this idea of grace. By the way, that is the definition of grace, as Asabedo says. The idea there's nothing more we can do to gain love or to give it away or to lose it. That's grace. That's the story that we're sharing in uh, Heart of Town, as we say. I do think, though, that there is a cert- another truth uh, to grace when it comes to our imperfection, is that we can certainly say, we're humble enough to say, you know, I know as a person, I don't deserve God's grace. But we also say, but I certainly know that you don't. So the part of the story of Advent is an understanding that this is a story that begins here that's so large that it provides grace to everyone um, with, without reservation, or without anything stepping in grace's way. But there's another aspect to grace here as well. There's something that accompanies it, and that's the idea of truth. And Acevedo also speaks to that as well. Jesus came to provide us grace and truth. But well, how do those two things fit together? Well, grace is this promise that no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how imperfect we are, that God's love is with us no matter what. That is an essential truth to the Christian story. And it's a truth that pushes us to live better. Dr. Kevin always talks about grace and response. And so if grace is the promise that God is always with us, then truth is is how we are to respond. Truth is this idea of obedience, um, following upon the ordinances of God, of living the right way. And we can't have grace without truth. If, if we just have grace without truth, then it's a free-for-all. Well, God loves me, so I can do whatever I want. But if we have truth without grace, then we get into this hateful legalism about our faith when there's nothing that, that we can never live up or never do enough, that's God, that we're, that we're judged on our actions only. And guess what? Our actions will never be enough. So we live in this holy tension, this holy balance between grace and truth, knowing that God loves us no matter what, and that pushes us to live a life of truth and obedience and goodness and participation. So Advent is the story of the beginning of this story. And that's what we take joy in. This is a story of new beginnings. And after such a year of 2020, don't we all need a new beginning now? We read earlier in a chapter, I think it was chapter 3, one of the promises is that God meets us where we are no matter what. Um, That stuck with me through that study. Um, And this promise of grace and the hope of truth that comes with us is something that can be a part of our reality now. Jesus Christ has transformed all of history. And if he can transform all of history, he can transform our very personal reality right now. So, I hope we can step into that this year. I hope that we can step into the hope of grace and then respond to that by being sent. By being sent to share the truth and the hope of grace to our community. So why don't we end there? Why don't we remember that we have been sent into grace, that we have been sent into a life of truth and sent to share the story of grace in the heart of our town. It's more than just a slogan. It's hopefully something that pushes us to live the life that we have been uh, asked to lead. Merry Christmas to you. I hope again that this has been helpful. Um, We can't wait to be back together fully in church again so that we can sit across from each other. We can share in these studies together one-on-one and and share what's on our hearts. But until then, uh, know that your church, that we are praying for you, that we love you, and whether or not you're able to join us, you are missed, and you are a part of our church and grace community. Take care.
Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we hope to see you soon.